three, two. All right, we're with Steve Rosen, of course, the author of Tone Chaser. And Steve, what is the what is the uh, the subtitle? Please tell us. Oh, I'm glad you asked me that, man. Um, uh, firstly, you know it's funny. Um, tone, tone Chaser. A lot of people uh, write it as two words. Putting it together as one word, I wish I could take credit for that, was actually the uh, brain child of my art director, Daniel Gray. Daniel also just worked on Niels Lozauer, Niels Lozauer, the, the famous or infamous uh, Van Halen photographer. Uh, Neil just came out with a book called, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ed by Ed by Zlos. And Daniel art directed that. And uh, Neil also did the front and back covers of Tone Chaser. But Tone Chaser um, came about because Edward uh, once, actually in one of the final interviews I ever had with him, described himself as a Tone Chaser. And I thought that was fascinating because, you know, he could have said, yeah, man, I'm always looking for that great guitar sound. You know, I'm always building my guitars. I mean, he could have said something like that, which would have been interesting in and of itself. But for him to describe himself as a Tone Chaser, I thought was a very... Um, it was a very erudite thing to say for him to de describe himself as Tone Chaser. So the subtitle, Understanding Edward, works on a couple levels. So Understanding Edward, so if you look at understanding as an adjective, as in, um, uh, you know, musical Edward or um, gentle Edward, so Understanding Edward, you know, Ed Edward is an understanding person. It also works on the level of understanding as a, I think it's a verb. So understanding Edward in terms of trying to understand Edward and who he is. So I'm not the only one understanding Edward, trying to understand him. Understand him. I think it's everybody who's reading this book wants to understand him more. Um, I think that's what made him so amazing is that as much as we knew about him, we knew nothing about him at all. And I came to realize that. And again, my great sorrow was that um, I couldn't have interviewed him for the next 17 years uh, because maybe then I really could have understood who, who he was. And then the last part of that subtitle, my 26 year journey with Edward Van Halen. I was first gonna call it um, my 26 amazing years with Edward Van Halen. And that was too over the top. And the truth of it is, I loved being in his company, but not every moment was an amazing one. Some of them were, were pretty hard. Edward was a, a really, really, really honest person. I mean, brutally honest. And he didn't, he wasn't like that to be brutal. That's just who he was. Um, and if you can translate that into his guitar playing, I mean, I think that's, you know, what his guitar playing was, it was this very brutal, honest thing, you know, there were no effects, it wasn't affected, you know, when you heard Edward play, that's, that, that's, that's who you, that's who he was, hard thing to explain, um, so, you know, I thought Journey, I thought that, that kind of, that kind of, it, it described it, you know, because there was a lot of ups, you know, climbing mountains, and, and ascending to these higher places, and there were a lot of valleys, you know, um, so yeah, I was pretty happy with that, um, title. I mean, I'd worked, I had, I'd actually sent out a little, I think I did a little notice on some boards about some of the original titles. And I think one was, um, blood, frets and, and beers, you know, one was, uh, uh um, uh, I can't even remember some of the other ones, but I'm happy with Tone Chase. And when I heard Edward say that, I go, oh, there's my title. You know, that's how he's describing himself. That's who he is. So, uh, yeah. And, and yeah. at what point did you say, all right, it's time. It's time to really document. You've had your audio interviews, the YouTube clips or whatever. When did you say and why this is time to really document this book? You know, though I didn't do it, though I didn't physically start on it for 17 years, I had thought about it a lot and 
you know, every time I start to write it, I, I, I just, I, I couldn't find it. I, I didn't know what it was. You know, at first I, I, I thought I was going to write it in third person, you know, uh, uh, Edward Van Halen called me that day, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was sunny on that Thursday afternoon and uh, Ed Van Halen's third record was out. And, you know, I, 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 those books had been written or they were going to be written and that just didn't make sense to me. So I, I, I kept thinking about it. Plus, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I, I, I didn't know if I could write a book that would measure up to this legend, and let's face it, that's what he was, who, we, who was Edward Van Halen. I, I didn't know if I had it in me as a writer to, to portray him in an honest and meaningful way. I, I, you know, and, and it's like, I don't know if other writers ever think about that, but that, that to me is like, if I can't write something at least that I feel really good about, you know, I'm not going to write it. And then, you know, years went by and I had friends demand, we, you know, we think you should write that and that'd be a great story. And I go, oh, I don't know, man. Someday, maybe, 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 maybe. And then a friend of mine, Andrew Klein, and I'd work with Andrew on a Randy Rhodes book. Um, and we were talking one day and, and I had mentioned something about a Van Halen book. And I said, man, I, I don't know. I just can't, I just, I just can't find the voice. And he said, well, write it in first person. I go, what? He goes, yeah, man, just write it from your standpoint. I go, hey, I can write that book. You know, I called Ed that day, man, and he was still sleeping. So I went and had a cup of coffee and waited three hours and called him. That story I could write. And that was going to be an honest story because I'm right there. So I can make this guy, Steve Rosen, you know, say whatever he wants, but I mean, I'm going to really try to find the truth in this. And now this Steve Rosen guy can really remember what was happening there. So that was a huge door open. And then right around was 2000. I remember, um, you know, I was thinking more and more about it. Now, I remember it was my birthday, August 24th, 2000. And, uh, and I'll make this short because I write about the book. My cat would wake up in these horrible uh, early morning hours, two in the morning, three in the morning. He'd wake up, he'd meow, he'd want to be fed. I'd wake up to feed him and then I'd go back to sleep, you know. But then he'd, he'd meow when I went back to sleep. So I'd stay up and I'd have a cup of coffee. Well, one day on August 24th, it was my birthday. Um, I went and sat down at the computer and I just started writing. And I, you know, I mean, I knew it was going to be somehow Van Halen related, but I didn't know what. And I just started writing what was going to become the intro to the book. And I didn't know where it was going and I didn't know what was happening. And, you know, I wrote for several hours at the end of it, I read it and I go, this is okay. This is all right. You know, there's a, there's something there. And literally I did that every morning and my cat would wake up arpeggio every morning. He'd wake me up at two or three in the morning. I'd get up, I'd feed him. I'd make a big mug of coffee uh, I'd walk back upstairs in the little Hollywood Hills house I had, man, and um, uh, uh, my a rental, and I'd uh, I'd write, and I wrote, I wrote for quite a long time. I probably wrote till, you know, eight or nine in the morning. I mean, it was light, and it was like that. I wrote every single day for 14 months, and I'd never ever written that. Um, I'd never kept to a schedule. Um, uh, that that vigilantly. Uh, I'd written seven books previously. The longest any of those books ever took was, I don't know, man, three or four months. Granted, this book turned out to be twice as long, but those books came so easily. And honestly, once they were done, I, I never kind of did any editing. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, they're, they're good. And I was done with this one. Every time I get done with something, I'd go back and I'd go, oh, God, you know, that, that, that line, that word, that comma, man, I, I obsessed over this thing. I went over edits with, with Daniel, um, the art director, and God bless him for hanging in there. I mean, literally, man, we went over edits for months. I mean, there were commas, semicolons, which I hated. We got rid of those. At first, I left in all of Ed's uhs and ums. 
Um, and I thought, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's who he was. But it broke up the continuity and it didn't really have anything. So we had to go back and take all those out. Um, so yeah, man, uh, just, I, I don't know. I don't know if it was because of my birthday because I, you know, something hit me. Um, but, but the, the, the time just felt right, you know? And honestly, part of me thought, I want to write the book. I want to finish the book. And I want Edward to know I wrote the book. He, and I really believed this, and I thought this. He may be furious as hell that I wrote the book, and he may hate me, you know, he may despise me. I don't, I don't think he ever would have read the book because he never read, I don't think he ever read any interview I ever did with him, which is kind of funny in a strange way. Or he could have realized that I wrote this book about him, even though we hadn't spoken for 17 years. And maybe that was the entree into the beginning of the second part of a relationship. And I thought either way, you know, I, 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 I had to know. So I began the book and, um, you know, horribly, you know, uh, uh, a little less than two months later, you know, Edward passes on, on the 6th of October and um, it was horrible, you know, and, and, a question that people have asked, you know, well, did you think about stopping the book? And, and I mean, I, I don't want this to sound cruel, but certainly there was probably a moment. But honestly, I, at that point, I felt <clears throat> it was something that, and I hate to use the word that I had to do, like I was a martyr or, you know, it, it was catharsis. I hate those kinds of words, you know, but by then, you know, and again, it only been about a month and a half. But I, but I, honestly, man, I thought what I had written was really good, and I wanted to see it through. So I, I, I continued again. Yes, there was a pause there, so I continued, and yes, fourteen months later, and again, I couldn't find an ending. And every time I thought I was, I was done, I'd find, oh my God, I forgot that part, or the chronology was wrong, and just figuring out the chronology. Just figuring out, trying to figure out the first day, the date of when I first met Ed, uh, it took me, honestly, it took weeks trying to find out when that Cheap Trick date was. You go online and you're trying to find when Cheap Trick recorded in, in, in June, and I didn't know it was June, in 77, and you won't find anything. And I found it out because, how did I find it out? Ed referenced it in a later interview, or, or I did. I'm sorry. A, a couple of interviews later, I said, oh, yeah, man, you, you remember we met at the Cheap Trick um, show in June? And I knew it was 77. And, I, and as I'm writing, I go, oh, my God, it was Cheap Trick. I didn't remember who was playing. Anyway, I digress. So, yes, man, it was a, it was a long road. Um, it just felt like the right time was do it, to do it. I, I wish I could feel like, yeah, it was this. Like, no, I'm not going to do it. Yes, I'm going to do it. I think it was more a, a gradual metamorphosis to the point where, yeah, it, it, it feels right. And I'm going to, I'm going to, going to attempt to, to write this book. So, yeah. Well, again, uh, you're, you're paying tribute to him. This is a, a friendly guy. And it's pretty much in his words. He, you know, you weren't trying to write a tell all or defame him or, you know, show anything other than, you know, the greatness that he was. So, yeah, we're glad you didn't hesitate. Um, like I say, just knowing those conversations you had and the fact that he trusted you, enjoyed speaking to you about music. So you were kindred spirits, you know, to just pop up at your place in Laurel Canyon. Um, I've never heard him do that, you know, otherwise. So you, you were definitely a journalist he trusted. So we're... Uh, we're so glad you you made that happen. Now, would you would you label and date the recordings? Because obviously, you're recording what your interviews on cassettes when he was over. Yeah. Oh, dude, you're asking me these questions that make me cringe, but they're good questions, man. Or could you listen to the interview and see what album he was talking about and put it in there chronological you go. order? There you go. So the so the interviews become. The stepping stones. You're you're exactly right. 
Did I date the interviews? I always considered myself a documentarian. And I always thought, yeah, man, I, I'm really good about notating dates and when I did interviews. Well, let me tell you, man, I, I don't know. There must, I must have, I don't know, 35 or 40 cassettes of conversations and half of them are not labeled. And, oh my God, it made me crazy. So when I say assembling a chronology was mind-numbingly difficult, what you describe is exactly right. So yes, some of the in interviews, thankfully, were dated. So I know the exact day when some of these interviews took place. Many of them, I don't have a clue of the year, much less the date. So what I, I'll digress just a moment. I had a buddy, Dave Jeffress, who started making cassette copies for me, and I was smart enough to do that, back around, God, probably the mid 80s. Dave would make cassette copies for me. And Dave would basically label the cassettes as I had done them, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and he'd write on the cassette, the new label, you know, the artist, the Gary Brooker, Procol Harum, uh, January, and I'm just tossing the dates out here, 76, you know. Um, so I was giving him, I, I had, I had um, archived the cassettes when I had done them, Chronologically, I didn't know the years. In other words, um, the, the cassettes in the front were older than the cassettes behind it. You know, they were stacked. I used to stack them in these orange crate boxes. So I knew that the ones before came, the ones in the front came before the ones in the back because, you know, as, a, as a, I did an interview, I'd place it behind, you know, uh, the, uh, the more recent ones. But I had no idea about some of the dates. So I had a little idea of some of the years because, you know, an interview might have been sequenced there around the interviews that were all dated around 81 or 82. So I had some idea, but I really had no idea because some of them might have been misplaced, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going through the interviews and I have them. I have a, a, a like a, a, a read at a printout of um, all the Van Halen interviews I've done with the dates and, and the ones without the dates. So the early ones, like I said, had dates on them. Then I get to the ones that I had, had no dates. And as you well described, I'd have to sit there and I transcribe these interviews. So you're hearing a lot of interviews you've never read before. So as I'm transcribing these interviews, thinking, oh, this is the interview for, uh, you know, uh, between women and children first and, uh, Again, my chronology is bad. Uh, Fair warning. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so I'm listening for some hint about, yeah, we were, you know, in there and, and, you know, something that would tell me something or give me some idea of the time of year or, hey, man, you know, uh, you know, we're on the road in uh, uh, Springfield. And, you know, I could look up, you know, 1980. Were they anywhere in Springfield? Oh, 1980, uh, February 14th, you know, so I can... So, yeah, man, but it was a lot of detective work. And I write in the book um, that some of the chronology I may have fictionalized. Um, um, I don't think it, it really means anything to the story, but it had to be done that way to uh, make sense of this. Um, but I think I got pretty close. I mean, I agonized over these uh, interviews. You know, he said one little thing like that reference to the whiskey, and I mean, that was like, I mean, I, I tell you, man, I looked for weeks trying to find that day, because the, the first day I met Edward, I felt was really important. Maybe to me only, but I had to know that day, and I finally found Well, I out. know mid-77, Cheap Trick were on tour with Kiss, and they played multiple shows at the Forum. Maybe on a day off, Epic Records says, we're going to send you into the whiskey, and we're, we're going to record your live show for, you know, this, this quote live album. Obviously we know later that year they recorded the real live album in Budokan in Japan. Yeah. And that's what broke them. But maybe it was a, 
like a radio promo kind of a thing on a day off from that Kiss tour. That could have been it. Obviously, Ed was connected to Gene Simmons and took a liking to Rick Nielsen. So it, that may have been what, what that well, could have been. Was. Yeah, they, they actually recorded there for two days. Yeah, I never heard of this album, uh, Something Live. Um, but uh, Yeah, it's probably one of those, you know, rare radio promos that, uh, you know, they had King Biscuit Flower Hour, all these different live things back then. And obviously it was never commercially released. I mean, even Budokan was only supposed to be Japan only, but people were buying so many imports. Epic put it out here and, you know, hence uh, the the groundswell that Cheap Trick had. But yeah, yeah no, that's, that's amazing. Now, we obviously, obviously knew that Ed didn't trust everybody. He was shy. He was introverted it was all about the guitar he trusted you in continuing to talk to you and all that um but what were some of the other traits that you you saw in ed as you would casually be hanging out you know at your place what um what kind of person was he besides you know his guitar stuff yeah i mean that it's such a difficult question i mean it it took me 580 pages to answer that question well he was obviously confident you know when you saw him at the stadium oakland coliseum day on the green Uh, by the way pat travers was also on the bill he went on right right after van halen and before foreigner and then aerosmith that's right um did did you get a sense that he was kind of humble he just felt like he was just a a musician and trying to stay out of all the the hoopla yes and no, it, it was a humility, um, you know, with a footnote by it. Edward knew. Edward knew how, how good he was. Edward knew that nobody played like him. Um, but he never talked about that. So that confidence that he showed at the day on the green show was not, like I said, it wasn't bravado and it wasn't false humility. It was just that he, he, he just knew it was his self-confidence, which is, I I think he was born to do it. This is what I'm, I'm here to do. Yeah. Not nervous. You know, maybe it's a bigger crowd than normal, but this is what I, I've been meant to do. My father was a musician and and that's what I do. That that's possible. I mean, I, I think self confidence is one of the most difficult things to achieve in life. I mean, spectacularly successful people aren't self confident, you, you know, and, and you sense it around them because they're always talking about themselves, and they're always, uh, you know, comparing themselves to other people. He never. He never did that. It was just the small things, you know. He, I never heard him bash another guitar player, um, which isn't to say that he wouldn't talk about another guitar player in musical musical terms. I write about that in the book. You know, who else was he? He was he was extraordinarily honest. He was unbelievably supportive with me. <laughs> I mean. Look, being around Edward Van Halen, and I write about this, and I wrote about it a lot, was was a surreal experience from the first day I met him to the last day we spoke. It was nothing short of, of amazing, and being in his company was intoxicating, and, and I wanted to be around him every moment. Um, but... That doesn't mean, like I said before, and this is me more than him, but the truth of it is when you are around someone like that, um, and I'm being really honest here, and I was honest about this in the book because I had to be. If I was going to be honest about Edward, I had to be honest about my own reactions to him. Um, There is no air left in the room, and not of his own doing, but... Ed occupies a large space, and um, not that I was anybody, but, uh, you know, if you're unsure about yourself, when you were around him, I mean, you disappeared, um, and that was that was not an easy thing. 
um, you know. Um, but he was so supportive. And if I and I and you don't want to go. Um, well, Ed, you know, talk to me, you know, Ed, you know, I never wanted to do that, but he, he, he always sensed that, you know, and he goes, Hey man, or, or he, you know, put his arm around me or he just look at me and give me the smile. You know, the guy was, the guy had to be so in, in, in touch with his own emotions to understand that in somebody else, uh, you know, that, that was a really rare thing. You know, he, he was an amazing guitar player. We all know that. He, in, in, in his way, in that way, he was an unbelievably intuitive human being. And he was that way with everybody. And he was that way with his band. And when things weren't going right, there was a reason why. And Edward sensed those things. You know, that intuition thing. And with Ed, a major, a major thing with him was respect. You know, um, he gave it. And, and if he didn't receive it, and not that he expected it, because he always earned it. But if he didn't receive it, that's what hurt him. You could say, Ed, that solo kind of sucked. And you go, okay, I'll do it again. But if you said, Ed, you know, you're solo, man. You know, Richie Blackmore could have done better. Or, you know what I mean? It was a disrespect. And when he sensed that, that's, that's what upset him. And I write about that a lot in the book. And you'll read a lot about that. And um, that was a huge part of it. So, man, in, in answer to your question, uh, he, he was so many things. I leaned on him so many times and he, he never, you know, made you feel small or insignificant or your problems weren't as important as his problems. And on the other side of that, like you said, he trusted me and I don't know what that was. I mean, I think I'm a trustworthy person and I was around him a lot and I never betrayed a trust and I never wrote a single word he didn't want right didn't want written and I think I was a great listener and I knew about music so maybe all those things you know equal comfort this guy Steve Rosen I can feel comfortable I'm safe around him so he'd tell me things as well you know and um you know you try and say the right things or you try and listen and you hope at the end of the day what you said means something to him and um but yeah, I mean, I, I, I loved him for those things. I loved him, obviously I loved him for his guitar playing. And I loved him for being this guy that every time I was around him, he made me feel good, you know? And again, notwithstanding me feeling, you know, oh, Ed, you're, you know, you're, you're disregarding me, you know? That's me, that was all on me. But even then he, he, he'd make that all right. So he was a special person then. Um, and I know that everybody around him felt the same way. Everybody felt uh, like they were under his shadow. I mean, everybody, not just strangers or friends or acquaintances. I mean, everybody. And I write about that in the book and you'll read that. So, yeah. Now, was there a later time that you eventually saw them at the forum or sports arena or any of those other yeah, LA yeah, shows. I saw the sports arena again. Got to see them in their saw, full glory. Yeah, I saw them at um, uh, uh, the forum, and then I saw them at um, uh, in Chicago. Uh, that's when I did that uh, story in '86, uh, the life and times of Edward Van Halen for Guitar World, that cover, uh, which was sort of the beginning, in a way, of this book in a different form. Um, uh, Joe Louis Arena and that show, I remember, that was with Sammy. Um, but yeah, they were, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, they were, they were unbelievably good. I mean, the spectacle of it and yeah, the, the glory of it, and, you know, the new singer and, 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 you know, to find that much success with a new singer um, was just, you know, it was just mind blowing. And um, Edward just astonished me all over again. You know, I mean, I, I think God, he is, 
so unbelievably good. And then, you know, you'd see him on stage and he's huger than life, you know, and the sound of his guitar and God, just that ease with which he did everything, uh, you know, um, was just, it was just amazing. And it's just, there weren't many guitar players who had that in my mind. And again, you remember how high I set this bar. And there were only a few players that I'd ever seen uh, who, who had that finesse and this thing with the guitar. Um, I mean, even great, great, great guitar players, I, I don't think had that thing where they were just welded to the guitar. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he practiced yeah. so much. He was into it. It was, it was like a third arm. It was just part of him and the confidence was amazing. I mean, for a one guitar band, they had such a big sound. Yeah, they were pretty amazing, um, you know, as a as a trio with a singer. Um, but it, it, there were so many elements that go that go into that. You, you know, I mean, I know we talk a lot, a lot about it, but you know, Edward building his own guitars was, you know, genius on a completely different level. I cannot think, and I write about this in the book, and it's interesting because Edward later would meet both of these guys and I introduced him to one of them, which I read about the book. But if you think of guitar players who built their own guitars and played those guitars, and I'm not talking about signature guitars, you know, that uh, Gibson does the signature slash or Steve I. Ibanez, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about a guy who's in there, you know, in the garage, hacking off, you know, buying bodies and necks and pickups and experimenting and getting the tremolo and the nuts and the frets and the wiring and doing all that. I can only think of two people, um, Les Paul and Brian May. Um, so you talk about Ed and, and his ease. Well, here's a guy who's playing a guitar that he's built. And what makes it even more extraordinary is that he's built a guitar with a sound, and I believe this, this is the Brown sound, that he's heard in his head. So he hears the sound and he now goes about crafting a guitar to create that sound. I mean, that is, that's like coming up with a result and then trying to write the formula for it. You know what I mean? It's not like creating the guitar and going, oh, that's the brown sound. It's him hearing the sound and then creating the guitar and knowing that, oh, I'm going to need a humbucker. Oh, no, it's not going to be there. No, it's got to be, uh, you know, uh, put right into the body. You know, uh, no, it's got to be uh, the tremolo can't be floating. That to me is, you know, I remember talking to everybody. He goes, no, it's not that hard. You just do it. You know, just, you just put the neck on the body. I go, no, Ed, it, it's not that easy. So, you know, so that was part of the whole thing of that of that image of him with the guitar, you know. Um, it, it was just all of those elements, you know. It was just, it was just, it was just a lot of things. Um, yeah, it was like a mad scientist, you know. He, yeah, he was. He built, he built Frankenstein, you know. He, it was just unbelievable. He heard it, he, he saw it, and figured out how to do it and um and 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 talk you know writing for the guitar magazines talk about the enormous influence he had i mean you know everybody wanted to sound like him they wanted to figure out how he got those those sounds i mean his impact on the industry was so staggering and to him he was so humble when you saw him live or on the record, besides Eruption, which Ted Templeman had the brilliance to get out there first, he never did long solos. There, there weren't. He wasn't overindulging in the guitar. To to Ed, the band and the song seemed to always come first. Yes, the the guitar was outrageous, but unless it was a great song, and this could be played on the radio, it it, it seemed like he, you know. Um, was a team player. I mean, that, that that's pretty much true. For Edward, the song 
and the, the harmonics of it, and I don't mean harmonics, I mean the, the, uh, the harmony of the song, the chords, um, the orchestration of the song, that was paramount. That, that was everything. Um, and Edward, yeah, he wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't going to put a 32-bar solo in a, in a three-and-a-half-minute song. And you listen to those songs. Um, I mean, I know in the first two records, I mean, I don't think there's a song over four minutes. I mean, I don't, I don't know if any of those songs are over four minutes. Um, you know, they're all three and a half minute songs. He was really aware of, of song formats. Um, um, but what was so amazing about his, his writing is that unlike other bands, I mean, you can follow their formula, you know, it's a, you know, as any songwriter kind of knows, you know, there's a, you know, it's a, it's a verse and then there's like a B section and then that kind of goes into the chorus, you know. And then it's a solo and a B section and then like a bridge, which is like this other little part into a solo into the chorus out. Edward knew all that stuff and I think he, and, and I'm positive he just threw it all away. For Edward, it can be verse, 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 chorus, you know, bridge. It, it just didn't matter. And, and I think a lot of people overlook, you know, his actual songwriting um, and his orchestration of songs. Um, I mean, his impact, yeah, I mean, every, every every music journalist has written about that. Everybody wanted to know how he played Eruption, and they all thought it was keyboards. And um, uh, honestly, with Ed, yeah, the, you know, there was the humility factor. It meant nothing to him to hear other guys doing it. Uh, but it actually pissed him off. He goes, well, why don't they just come up with something on their own? And I remember him talking about it, and I don't want to talk about it because it's in the book, but um, he talked about, you know, a guitar player actually stealing his solo. It wasn't Eruption. It was some other solo in a song he did. And I mean, that really pissed him off. Um, and uh, so he just thought, yeah, you know, why don't they just go out there and 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 and, and find their own thing? But his, his impact, you know, I, I, I say this in the book. Um, I loved Edwards playing. He was one of my favorite guitar players. Um, Jeff Beck is my favorite guitar player again because that's the era I grew up in and Truth and Beckola and seeing the Beck band and you, you know one of the first big interviews I did was with Jeff Beck and, and I was in bands and I was doing shapes of things you know and so Jeff Beck to me was you know he was he was the greatest but I believe that Edward Van Halen was the most influential guitar player who ever lived, uh, more so than Jimi Hendrix, more than Jeff, more than Paige, more than all of them. Um, um, uh, I think there are more guitar players who wanted to play like Ed, uh, who wanted a one pickup Strat type guitar uh, than anybody who wanted to play like Jimmy or either the, of the Jimmys or, or, or Beck, or David Gilmore, any of those guys. Um, uh, yeah, Ed, Ed's influence, you know, because of the guitars he built um, and who he was and all that stuff we're talking about and, you know, just that, that thing that he had, you know, that indefinable thing. And even the great, the great guitar players, and I've met a lot of them, you know, even they're missing that, that little piece. I mean, they're icons and they're legends and they're formidable guitar players and they're beautiful artists, but what makes Ed, you know, from this great legendary guitar player into an icon? I, I, I mean, that, that is a, I mean, it took me, like I said, nearly 600 pages, you know, in some form or another trying to talk about that. Um, and I don't know if I have the answer. I don't know if there is an answer. You know, what makes somebody who gives them that quality? I don't know. But I think it's all these things we've talked about that, that just come together. And, um, you know. Well, I think a lot of it had to do with his consistency because every album had new innovations. They had new tones, new sounds, and there were always hits. They never put out a dud. I mean, the six albums with Roth and the four with Sammy, he always delivered. The consistency was unbelievable you look at a band like boston they had this giant first album and then it all kind of 
dissipated, you know, from, from there. But, you know, you look at the body of the work and he always innovated. He was a trailblazer on every single record he ever put out. Um, that is, it, it, it's true to some respect. I mean, there are a lot of guitar players I mean, there are, you know, there are bands who put out consistently great records with great guitar players, but they still, the guitar player doesn't rise to the, uh, the level that Ed does. And I think it goes beyond his music. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that indefinable thing um, that he had that maybe only a handful of other guitar players had. Well, like you say, when you saw the smile, you know, up close, people would see that in these arenas and nobody had ever smiled before. I mean, no Led Zeppelin or Deep Purple or, you know, even Beck or any of these guys. No, no, nobody showed how much joy they had playing as Ed. And that I think had a lot to do with it. You just saw that he, he, he was born to do this. He just, you know, loved um, hearing people, you know, enjoy his music, and he just felt blessed to be able to do it at that level. That was certainly a big part of it. The smile did not hurt, for sure. Yeah. And and talk a minute about Mr. David Lee Roth, because, you know, some people minimize. Well, Dave's just, you know, arrogant, this party, or he's running around, he's chasing girls, or whatever. But Dave wrote all the lyrics. Dave may have had that artistic tension with Ed, but I think that was a lot of, again, the success. If everything was kumbaya, it, it might not have had that, you know, tension. Ultimately, it split the band when Dave left, but, you, you know, t- talk about how important Dave was in the formula of, you know, those first six records of, you know, Edward really having a foil to... You, you know, raise his bar and make those songs radio ready. And then live, Ed could do whatever he wanted because Dave was the master of ceremonies. As I mentioned, you know, I'd only interviewed Dave once. <clears throat> I ran into a couple times and he was always very friendly. I mean, he knew that I was, you know, I was friends with Ed. So it was a, it was a cordial relationship. Um, Dave was responsible for lyrics and melodies. Edward never tried to uh, interfere with that. Um, And I write about this again in the book, and Edward acknowledges that um, a lot. Um, You know, there's that... There's that age old argument. Well, Edward would have been successful with any singer. Well, obviously, he proved that with Sammy to a lesser extent, you know, with Gary Sharon. Um, um, look, Ed would have risen to the top uh, in any band, whether they had the success of Van Halen or not. I mean, that's impossible to say. I mean, who knows? But um, Dave was important, um, and Edward understood that. Um, their relationship was not great. I, I write a lot about that. Um, we talked about the respect thing, and, and again, that's in the book uh, in detail. And um, that's where it got sour. Um, Dave taking things for granted. Um, uh, but Dave... Dave was 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 half of the music. Um, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I asked Ed, Ed. Ed never knew what one lyric was. I don't even know. I think he probably knew the titles of the songs, but that was about it. But that was just Ed. You know, he said Dave writes about what he wants to write about, and you know, it doesn't really impact my life, which makes sense. That's a fair enough uh, explanation. Um, yeah, Dave was important. I, I, I mean, obviously. Um, yeah, I think again, it really is the I, chemistry, you know, those four elements. You can't understate Michael Anthony's importance. 
You can't understate Alex Van Halen's importance. You know, not number one, just looking out for his baby brother, you know, really, you know, um, giving Ed the, the space to become who he became, you know, and watched his back, you know, but all four of those members, they, they were like the Beatles. You couldn't have take one of them out and had the same chemistry. That's true. And I, and, and again, uh, I write about that in the book and, um, I think that explanation is, is, is pretty interesting. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Well, we, we certainly, um, appreciate your candor and, you know, knowledge and, and letting everybody into a special relationship for those of us that, you know, met Edward, we can only imagine him hanging out, you know, in the living room, strumming a guitar, playing you <laughs> songs that haven't even been released yet or stuff that was about to rock stadiums and arenas all over the world. Yeah. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Now I know we're going to put the links down below here where Good. people can click to, to order the book. Can I show this? Yes, please. Wow. So it's incredible. Uh, yeah. So I, I just want to explain real quickly. Um, so uh, the reason the book took so long, one, it was my fault. You know, I, I thought, yeah, a book takes two months to print. I was wrong. You know, then COVID hit. There were really serious paper shortages, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the book started out as a six by nine book. It had to become a seven by 10 book because uh, there was so much text. A six by nine book, you know, the book would have been, you know, like a medical book would have been like three inches thick. I don't know if you can see like the reflection of Ed. That's called UV and the reflection on uh, the Les Paul. That's like a special coating. So when you hold it, you know, special coating, which I thought was great. And the original title was in black and white. And now it's obviously in red. Plus it's embossed. If you roll it, run your finger over it, it's erased. And same with the side. I know that's a little hard to see, but uh, that's also embossed. And then I'm going to show you the back cover. Um, so many of you may have seen what you think is this photo, which was taken by Niels Lozauer that day that uh, I ran into Ed uh, at the Day on the Green. Well, this is a second shot that Neil had. When I was writing the book, I said, hey, Neil, do you think you have any more shots of Ed and me? Because he took several of them, and they're, they're in the book. And he goes, well, let me look. And he pulled out this photo, and I go, oh, my God, nobody's ever seen that. I just love this photo because, you know, Ed looks like, you know, we talk about that look about self-confident and humble and sure of himself, but he's like a little kid and he's so happy to be there. I mean, all of that is in his look, man. He's the tone chaser. I just thought that was such a, an amazing photo. So, um, oh, and also I wanted to say, uh, you can't read the text here, but one of the blurbs is written by Paul Brannigan. Uh, Paul wrote uh, the book uh, Eruption. Um, Paul's an English writer. It's a fantastically beautiful book. And the other one is um, uh, Brad Talinsky, Brad and Chris Gill's book, um, also, also called Eruption Conversations with Edward Van Halen. And Brad was kind enough to uh, uh, write a few uh, kind words uh, about the book. So um, yeah, man, uh, that's it. Um, and uh, the link, or are you going to you going to put that up there? Yeah, or? we're going to we're going to put the link right under the video here, so people can click and order and um, enjoy this. Um, it's absolutely, you know, uh, amazing uh, getting the insights into Ed, like like Brad and you know his book. It, this is this is your experiences, your your unique conversations with him, and um, you know we can't wait. We can't wait to. Uh, absorb it, share it, see everybody's reaction to it. Steve, it's been a supreme pleasure. I know you've uh, interviewed everybody and, you know, um, seen so much, you know, in the music world, but um, we know what Edward meant to you and what he means to so many people. And I know your insights into him as a person um, just makes us appreciate his music and his talent that much more. I mean, we can hear his talent. The music will live on forever. But to just know um, the person, it just makes us appreciate it more. Now, now when we hear the music the next time, we have a little more insight, a little more depth to our 
appreciation, you know, for what made Edward uh, easily one of the most important musicians of the century. And we know 100 years from now, people will still be studying his his impact, you know, just like Hendrix, just like Les Paul, just like, you know, the the, the greats. It will uh, live on. It's amazing to see what his son Wolfgang's doing, you know, playing the, playing the Van Halen songs and the tributes to Taylor Hawkins and, you know, what he's done on his own. And he didn't he didn't rely on, you know, his dad's music, you know, for his band Mammoth. And, you know, it's pre- pretty amazing to to think what a, a father Edward was, too, in addition to all this. Any yeah, closing man, comments, yeah. Steve? Yeah, man, just 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 in closing, you bring up a lot of great points. My, my one great desire in writing the book, well, one of many great desires, was, yes, that you, you know, the fan, you, you know, people have listened to Van Halen from the beginning, and, you know, you come away from the book with just a little more understanding than you did before. And if that happens, then I, then I did my job. Um, you know, that, that, would, that would make me very happy. And I tried as hard as I could, man, to explain those moments and try to get into side Ed's head. And, you know, I spent a fair amount of time with him. And look, like I said, I couldn't possibly know him 100%. Nobody can know anybody 100%, even if you're married to that person for 50 years. But, you know, I, I think I understood him in a way. And I think I interpreted things correctly. And I tried to write about that in a way that you could understand that and walk away thinking, yeah, that, yeah, I, I, I think I know Edward a little better. That, that's what I'm, I'm hoping. And um, um, yeah, man, I, I just hope for the people who've been waiting months and some of you have, uh, you, know, you know, maybe you pre-ordered you back in January or February. I know it's been a long time in coming. And I've had some comments from you guys and, and you, you all seem to be really, you know, kind of overjoyed with the book. And that really touches me. That means a lot. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, uh, so, yeah, you, you bring up some great points. Uh, I hope everybody loves the book. And, um, yeah, so I, 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 think it's a, I think it's an important book. Um, and I, 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 I do believe if you read it, you'll, you'll come away um, with a little more, maybe even more respect for Edward and hopefully a little more respect for the guy who wrote it. So thanks a lot, man. Well, our special guest has been Steve Rosen, author, tone chaser, understanding Edward, and of course, so many more books and articles. And we love um, your passion for music. It's infectious, just as the music is. And Steve, thanks so much for uh, great interviews here and uh, helping us understand Edward that much more. And uh, best of luck on, on not only on this book, but all your future ventures. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. See you, buddies.